Well, good morning. It is so good to be here with you and to, to share God's word with you. If you would, open to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 9, in fact, is where you will find uh, our text for today. And uh, again, Brother David, uh, I, I, a n- number of new faces here today. I know I've met some of you. If I haven't met all of you, I'm Pastor Bob. And uh, we're so glad that you're here. We're so glad that, that all of us are here. And uh, this morning we're going to, uh, we're, we're taking a few weeks before we jump into our next book study to, to just cover a couple of things that, that I felt led to, to share with you. And, and uh, today we're going to look at Acts chapter 9 where we see uh, very quickly after Paul uh, becomes a Christian, after Saul is converted, um, we see his life as a model for uh, how we should all live as those who have come to follow Jesus. And, uh, and this morning, I, I want to begin by um, illustrating something with you. I, you may not know this, but the Navy has what they call the mothball fleet. Do we have any Navy people here? Okay? The mothball fleet. There are over 600 ships that are sitting in major ports throughout the United States that are they're not fully decommissioned. They're just sitting there uh, waiting just in case they're ever needed. And so the Navy actually spends a ton of money on keeping these ships up just enough that they don't sink and, uh, and painting them and, and just barely maintaining them in case they're ever needed. It's called the, the, the Navy Reserve Fleet. And, um, you know, the reality of it is is that if you, you ask any pastor... He'll tell you one of the largest frustrations in the church is we have a reserve fleet. We have a number of Christians who, who, who like those ships, just kind of sit and need a lot of maintenance, and, and they don't really serve. They're not really engaged. Have you ever heard of the 80-20 rule in the church? The 80-20 rule is that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. It's probably pretty true. It's not the way that it should be. If Christ has saved you from your sins, if if you've come to know Jesus as your Savior, if you've realized the the gift of what Jesus has given you, the grace of God that has come to you, it should animate you to want to serve. In fact, the Bible tells us that that Christ has uh, given us the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit, God has given us gifts. And so everybody in this body is a Somebody, right? We remember that, that, that every one of us are gifted and united together to serve. And, and, and the matter of the fact is, we can't do all that God would have us to do with the 80-20 rule, with a, with a mothball fleet. And so this morning, I want us to look at a baby Christian, someone who has just come to Jesus, someone who, who, who just became part of the family. And what does their life look like? Now I know you're going to say, well, that's Paul. He was an apostle. Well, he started off very much like every other baby Christian, needing to grow in the strength of the Lord, needing to understand the Word, needing to begin to serve and to get stronger and stronger in his faith. And the thing is, is that many people remain infants in Christ their whole life. Because they never seek to grow. So this morning, I want us to look at this text. And and I want us to see um, how Paul, after he becomes a a believer in Christ and he's baptized, immediately begins seeking to serve the Lord. And I want to challenge all of us. Are we serving the Lord? From this text, are are we engaging in the things that, that someone who is part of the family of Christ should begin to engage with in their lives. Now, you might not remember the, the, the conversion story of Paul, so I'll tell it real quick. You could go back and read it. It's the beginning of, of chapter 9. And, and so Paul, known as Saul mostly then, let me just say something on the front end. Have you ever heard the sermon uh, that, uh, that, that Saul became a Paul when Jesus changed him? Well, I got news for you. It preaches good, it sounds good, but Paul is called Saul 11 times after his conversion in the Bible. It's kind of like me. If you're the IRS, you call me Robert. 
but everyone else calls me Pastor Bob. And so just on the front end, let's, let's expel that notion that has become popular for some reason. But Saul is persecuting the church. He is he's the Osama bin Laden of the early church. He really is. And if you remember, he is on his way on the road to Damascus. He has letters signed by the chief priests to arrest Christians, to bring them back to Jerusalem where they will face trial. And something happens. A great light hits Paul, and the voice of Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he knew that it was the Lord. And, and the Lord caused this miraculous event where like scales came over his eyes. And he told him to go and pray and wait for a man. And then he went to a man, Ananias, and he said, Paul, you need to go out and you need to meet Saul. And Ananias goes, I know this dude. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is a bad guy. And he says, I have chosen him. And he goes and he meets him and he prays with him and his scales fall off and he, re- he acknowledges faith in Jesus, requests to be baptized, and he's baptized. It's an incredible story. It's an incredible story of how God can save even the individuals who we often write off, don't we? That, that God has the power, Jesus has the power, the, 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 the empty tomb that we celebrated last week is so powerful that anyone can receive Jesus as their Savior and be changed. And and so our text picks up with that. This is where our our text begins today, if you look at it. Let Let me read for you. Follow along. I'll begin reading in verse 19. And it says this, For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed. And said, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem for those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they were watching with the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were afraid of him. For they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him. How at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So all the church thought in all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, the peace was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit it multiplied. What we see here is we see an amazing life. An amazing life changed by Jesus. But Saul isn't the only one who was changed by Jesus, was he? Us in this room, we've been changed by Jesus. Does our lives look like this? Do our lives look like service? You know, one of the things that Luke is really highlighting here as he writes about Saul and he writes about this change is the fact that over and over again, people who knew who he was said something is different. Something has changed. Is this not the same one who was supposed to go and arrest the Christians and now he's, he's proclaiming that Jesus is the Christ? He's proclaiming Jesus is the Christ. He is confounding the Jews, the Jewish leaders in the synagogues because this one who was the enemy has been converted. His life has changed. You see how Luke's trying to show that? What shows that our life has been changed? Is it merely how we speak? No, it's our whole life, how we live. That's 
part of the reason why it's so important that when we come to Christ, if, if we call ourselves a Christian, our life should be marked not just by knowing Christ, not just by speaking of Christ, not just by saying we have a testimony that Jesus has saved us, that we've repented of our sins and trusted in Him, but we should have a life that individuals can see a life of service and dedication to Jesus. Do they see that in your life? Do they see that in mine? That's our challenge this morning. I, I want to show you quickly. We're going to go through this quick. But, but there's six things here that, that I want to show you that we see in the life of Paul as he begins his new life in Christ, as, as he begins to serve Christ, that are, I, I believe, models for all of us if we call ourselves Christ, uh, Christians. First is this. All believers should be going. All believers should be going. Look at verse 19. Taking food, he was strengthened for some days with the disciples in Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Now, it's very interesting here. Paul did not wait around long after he had been uh, saved. He, he could have thought, well, you know, I, I'm a new Christian. I, I don't know everything. Uh, they're going to ask me questions that I probably don't know the answers to. So maybe I should just wait until I learn enough before I start telling people about Jesus. You know, as they do surveys, that is the number one fear that people say. The number one fear, if you ask people why they don't share Jesus with others, why they don't tell others about the gospel, the number one fear that they list over and over again, survey after survey, is, I'm afraid I won't have all the answers. Well, I've got good news for you. I have spent more time in seminary than any human probably should. And I still don't have all the answers. You never will have all the answers. But you know what you do have? You have a testimony. You, you have a story about how Jesus worked in your life. About how you realized you were a sinner and that Jesus had died for you and you confessed Jesus and trusted in Jesus and began to follow Jesus and you saw your life change. And, and so uh, I might not have all the answers to the Bible. I might not have all the moral answers. I might not have all the, the difficult ethical questions that you have really tight and precise to convince you. But let me tell you this. I know Jesus. I know Jesus is alive. And I know Jesus changes people because he Change me. Jesus is Lord. Everyone can do that. We're called to be a witness. We're not called to be a debater. We're not called to be experts or scholars or scribes. We're simply called to be witnesses. What does a witness do? A witness tells others what they have experienced. If you've experienced Jesus, you can be a witness. You should be going that's the Great Commission, right? Go. Make disciples of all nations. Sometimes because it says all nations, we get a little overwhelmed and we're like, I'm not ready to move to Abu Dhabi. But, but the, the, the Greek of that is very interesting. It, it's technically as you go, make disciples of all nations. Guess what one of the nations is? Here, where we live. Your neighborhood, your workplace. Uh, you want to talk about international missions? We have internationals flooding to the United States. Now, I know on a civil side, there's, there's all kinds of debates and what we do. But the reality of it is, is that God has placed individuals that need Jesus, that need the gospel all around us. Now, throughout the nations, you can witness to people in America now. It's pretty amazing. Jesus is bringing them here. But wherever you go, you can be a witness. Wherever you go, you should be a witness. And maybe you're saying, well, I want to go. I want to do something. Fantastic. We have opportunities for you to go and for you to serve. We have mission trips that are coming up. We have serve day that's coming at the end of this month. You, we, we, we try to create all kinds of opportunities that, that you can go, that you can serve, that you can be involved, that you can be a witness with others. Let me tell you something. It's really, it's much easier to begin being a witness with others than just going on your own. So sometimes that's what you need. 
You just need to be with your brothers and sisters in Christ, engaged, engaged in missions, engaged in ministry, serving together, witnessing together. But all believers should be going. All believers are called to be ambassadors of Christ, witnesses to Christ. All of us have the testimony, Jesus is the Son of God. That's what we see with Paul, even as a baby Christian. All believers should be going. Second, all believers should be growing. All believers should be growing. If you would, turn over to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. At the beginning of Galatians, Paul spends some time defending the fact that he is an apostle called by Jesus Christ. He's doing that because a lot of rumors have been spread about him. Or a lot of harmful things have been spread about him. A lot of false narratives, fake news has been spread about Paul. And so Paul writes to the Galatians who are being troubled by these false teachers. And in the opening, he, he writes to defend that Jesus has called him as an apostle just as he called the others as an apostle. But in that, we have a little bit of information that's, that's helpful to us as we read about the account in Acts chapter 9 where, where Paul is converted and he begins to serve. And it, it says this in verse 15 through 18. But he who had set me apart before I was born and called me to his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and I returned to Damascus after three years I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. So here we have a little bit of information that Acts 9 just it doesn't give to us. And that is, in this process, before Paul uh, goes to, to Jerusalem, he spends three years in Arabia. Now, we're not given a whole lot of what he's done, but I think probably what he's doing is he's, he's strengthening his knowledge. He's growing in the Lord. He's, he's understanding what it means to be a Christ follower. He knew God of the Old Testament, but what does it mean to follow Jesus? He is growing deep. He is getting his roots. He's understanding the theology. He's understanding uh, what it takes. He's, he's practicing preaching to others. He's, he is growing in the Lord. And the truth of it is, is that when we first come to Christ, we are baby Christians. And we need to grow in the Lord. We grow in the Lord by spending time with him. By being in prayer. By spending time in the word. By finding opportunities to, to grow with others. It's interesting here it says that he, uh, he spent three years in Arabia. Um, I was told that a, a master's of divinity takes about three years. And my professors always told me that's why. Because Paul went away for three years. So <laughs> that's why seminary is three years. <laughs> Are you growing in the Lord? I mean, maybe you would say, I, I'm uncomfortable witnessing to someone... Because I've not sought to truly understand how this works. Now, I've got good news for you. We've got lots of opportunities to help strengthen your, your knowledge, to, to help you to be able to grow deep roots in understanding what the Word of God is. We, we have all kinds of groups that meet around the church. All kinds of, of, of opportunities to grow in, in the Lord. Sunday night, tonight I'm going to begin again. We're, we're going through a series uh, on what we believe as a church, going through our statement of faith. It's, it's a doctrinal study. It's pretty much the same thing that I'm teaching for Samford University on Thursday nights right now. Tonight we're going to talk about the doctrine of God. And so there's plenty of opportunities for you to grow together in the church, but ultimately you have to grow as an individual as well. To dedicate that every day you'll spend time with the Lord. Every day you'll spend time in prayer. Every day you'll spend time in the Word. And slowly and slowly, what you'll see is you begin to understand. The dots begin to connect. You begin to understand as you read the Old Testament how it points to Jesus. You begin to understand as you read the New Testament how it points to your life. You begin to understand uh, the theological principles that need to be applied in your life. And, and you begin to uh, be more and more useful to the Lord 
as you can teach and as you can help and as you can lead because you're growing in the Lord. Even Paul needed that. It says here that he grew. He grew in knowledge and ability because he wanted to know about Jesus. I, I think everybody that's truly saved wants to know more about Jesus. The question is, are, are we willing to take the things out of our life that distract us and spend time to grow in Jesus day by day. The third thing is this. All believers should be groaning. All believers should be groaning. L look at verse 23 back in Acts chapter 9. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, for they did not believe he was a disciple. You know, often new believers kind of naively think, now that I've trusted Jesus, everything's just going to be great. Let me tell you something. When you come to Jesus... When you place your faith in Jesus, when you turn from a, a life of sin and a life that the devil doesn't care because you're doing the things that he's cool with, and you start to follow Jesus, often as a new believer, that is the hardest time in your life to follow Jesus. Difficult things come. I, I, I don't want you to hear, as, as some would preach, that if you, if you just add Jesus, everything is wonderful and cheery. No, you... You actually join an army. You join a family and you join an army. You, you, you join a spiritual battle that's taking place. Now, you will know joy. You will know satisfaction. You will be uh, encouraged and gifted and supported the entire way. But don't think that it's a life without road bumps. It, it comes from without, from outside of the church here. Uh, Saul is is begin the, the, uh, the, the Jews and the, the Hellenizers, they are uh, beginning to form up against him. They're, they're hearing him proclaim Jesus. He's confounding them. And, and so they get this plot that they're going to, uh, that they're going to capture him and, and kill him. And so he sneaks out through the wall in a basket. Right? <laughs> Pretty crazy. The truth is this. When you begin to tell people about Jesus... If you proclaim the gospel, it is an offense. The gospel must be an offense. The problem in so many churches today, the problem with so many pulpits today, is they try to proclaim a gospel that has no offense. It's going to make everybody happy. But you can't do that. Because the gospel says you are a sinner. And you need Jesus. And without trusting and believing in Jesus, your sins will bring God's punishment and God's wrath and God's judgment in eternal hell. You, you can't get away from that. Now, as a church, my hope is that we try to remove every offense except the gospel. I, I don't want people coming in and going, oh, church... It's nasty. They don't even take care of the place. Oh, church, they're rude. No one says hi to me. Oh, church, it's so uncomfortable in there. I, I don't want those things. But I want every man, woman, and child that comes and hears the word of God proclaimed here to be moved to a point of decision. That without Jesus, without trusting in Jesus, living for Jesus, becoming a Christ follower, you cannot be accepted by God. You must repent of your sin. And that's offensive to individuals who love sin. That's offensive to individuals that think that, that they can save themselves just by cleaning up a little bit. That's offensive to, to individuals that, that, that live as the culture and, you know, you do your way and I do my way, relativism, that, that all roads lead to the top. That's an offense to say that there is by one name, and one name only, by all men much be saved, Acts 4.12, the name of Jesus Christ. And if you proclaim that, I mean, there's ways to proclaim it and be a jerk, right? But if you just 
simply as lovingly as you can serve people and, 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 and tell them you must trust in Jesus, you will see that there is groaning involved. Not all will receive. Not all will accept. And here we see even the most extremes as they seek to kill and murder Paul. Here's a sad part. Groaning not only comes from outside, but sometimes it, it comes from inside the church. <laughs> you look here and Paul, Saul, he's been three years a faithful preacher of Jesus Christ. He goes to Jerusalem and, and the apostles are like, I don't know about this guy. I, I don't think he's the real deal. His life used to be too hard. I don't know if we can trust him. I don't know if we can accept him. I imagine that rejection must have hurt. I imagine uh, Paul, for a few days before Barnabas fell, f found him, must have been pretty lonely. And it must have really hurt. You know, new believers are often naive about other Christians. They think, isn't it great to be part of God's family? We're all going to get along. This is going to be wonderful and joyful. We're going to serve Jesus together. This is going to be like nothing I've ever experienced. It's going to be so awesome. And then they encounter jealousy or strife, fighting over the most minor of issues. <laughs> Somebody didn't eat out of my casserole, and so, you know, how dare them? <laughs> and they're often not prepared for it. New believers sometimes can get delusioned because they encounter difficulties within the church. Sometimes very big difficulties, judgment still after they've become a Christian, much like Paul faced. I want to say something, and you know, I've been hurt more by church folk than people outside of the church, really. As a pastor, I, I, I've had more things slandered and said about me by people in the church than by people with outside of the church. And maybe that's happened to you. Maybe your experience is that you've been hurt in the church as well. Let me say something to you. I'm sorry. It shouldn't be. I, I truly am sorry. In my time as being a minister, I've ministered with many people who have been hurt and abused in churches. And I truly am sorry if you've experienced that. But let me tell you this. Just because someone's hurt you, don't give up on the church. And don't give up on Jesus. Don't, don't, don't walk away. Don't think that, that I don't need them. Because the church is incredibly valuable to your life, to your Christian life, to your Christian walk. And if you go out and Lone Ranger it, uh, I can tell you testimony after testimony of individuals that find themselves vulnerable to temptation and sin and hardship. It's a real thing. We have to groan sometimes in the church. It's not going to be perfect, but the reality of it is, is that knowing that, we should seek to, to walk in unity, to walk in love, to serve one another. One of the things that should mark Christians is repentance. Repentance is not just when we come to Christ. Repentance is an ongoing feature of the Christian life. You should be continually before Jesus repenting of your sins. You should before others when sin has occurred. Ask for forgiveness. Repent of sins. Restore relationships. But don't give up. Keep going. Paul didn't give up. He didn't change. He didn't say, you know what? They'd probably accept me if I went back. No, he knew that he had to follow and serve Jesus, the risen Lord. Uh, this leads me to the next point. We see Barnabas here. All believers should be guiding. All believers should be guiding. Look at verse 27. But Barnabas took him in and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke to them and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. Good old Barnabas. Now, we don't know how uh, Paul and Barnabas get together here. We're, we're not really uh, told what's going on, but, but Barnabas comes up to him, and, and he takes him in, and he, Barnabas, do you see this? Barnabas goes before the apostles, 
And he says, guys, this is real. Look at his life. Look at his testimony. Look what he's done since the encounter that he has had with Jesus. And he brings him in. The reality of it is, is that all of us should be seeking to guide new believers. We should all be seeking to guide individuals who are growing in their faith. This isn't just a job for the pastor. This is a job if you're a parent <coughs> that the Lord has given you in discipling your children. We're all to be involved in discipling others and helping to bring them up. We're all to be welcoming to those who have experienced and come to Christ and are new in their faith. And guess what? They're going to struggle. They're going to have bumps. They are working through a, a life that followed what Satan wanted to trying to live a life that Jesus wanted. And so sometimes it's messy. But we're there to guide them and to encourage them, to grow them, and to strengthen them. Do you really think you've always had it all figured out? You know, one of the greatest things that I love about this church is that we are a multi-generational church. And I love serving in a multi-generational church. A multi-generational church is like a, a healthy family where you have uh, grandparents and, and children and grandchildren and even great-grandchildren. And, and there's different ways that, that each group contributes to the family. And, and you need all of those ways to make the family as strong as possible. And in a church like this, that's what we have. And I love it. I love seeing the children running around the church. I love hearing the, 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 the cries of babies in the church. I pastored a church that didn't have babies. It made me weep. I love it. I love the life. Do, do you realize these children that we're investing in, that we're loving, it, they are the future of the church, right? Think 20 years from now. Some of you won't be here. They are going to be the next leaders, the next generation. And we've seen that. I mean, look at this. Do you realize Matthew Julian, who leads our worship, he used to play on the little playground out there. Some of you taught him in VBS and Sunday schools. And you watched the Lord work in his life and, and to grow him. And now he's here and serving the Lord. Isn't that amazing? Think about this. Brent Watson. He's our chairman of deacons. He, you, some of you taught him in vacation Bible schools and, and in Sunday schools. And the Lord, through the ministry of this church, has brought him up. And now he's here with his family, leading and serving in the church. This church has raised up multiple individuals who are serving in ministry uh, throughout the United States. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? We want to continue to see that. And to do that, we always have to have that mindset of guiding, of guiding the next generation, uh, of raising them up to be the spiritual leaders in the church, of instilling our faith and our DNA and, and our love for Jesus and our commitment to the Word of God that this place, what we love and what we serve, that it might continue to grow and be here as a light on the hill here in Meridianville shining throughout the world. Amen? And that only happens if we're intentional, if we're seeking to guide and to love and, and to invest to be a multi-generational church. We should all seek to be gathering. Gathering. Look at verse 30. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and they sent him off to Tarsus. And so the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Verse 31 is one of seven progress reports that we see in the book of Acts. Just these little summaries of, of how the church was continuing to grow, how the word would increase, the ministry would increase, the testimony would increase, the, the churches would expand, and Jesus was active in bringing more and more people into the churches as they were growing, as they were being obedient to Christ. It serves as a reminder for us that, that we are called to gather together as a church. We are called to be in fellowship with one another. We are called to, to gather, to do like we do right now, to praise the name of Jesus, to strengthen one another, to support one another, to be a family, real family. 
God loves that. But we can't just be inwardly focused. We also have to remember that we live amongst a world of lost and dying people with no hope. Of people who don't know Jesus. People who are going through difficulties of life. They're going through uh, sickness. They're going through, uh, through financial problems. They're going through relational problems. They're, they're going through hardships and struggling and battling sin. And they have no hope. They don't know that they'll ever be forgiven. Uh, do you remember those days? Do you remember what it was like to live without Jesus? To live just for yourself? To think that the, the next pleasure would satisfy you only to realize that, that you needed something else and something else and something else? That's what fills our community. That's what fills your neighborhoods. That's what fills your workplaces. It's individuals that, that need Jesus, and they don't know it. And that's why God's put you there, to be a light, to, to call them, to, to witness, to, to, and ultimately to gather. You know, it's really not that hard to ask somebody that you work with or a neighbor would you like to come to church with me? Here's a great way. Do you go to church anywhere? Oh, well, you know, I mean, sometimes I, sometimes I go. We used to go. We've gotten out of the habit after COVID. That's like the number one answer I've learned now, right? We've gotten out of the habit after, after COVID. Well, my family goes to First Baptist Meridianville. It's a great church. We love it there. Would you, would you like to come with me one Sunday? You can come to church. We'll, we'll go to lunch. You know, studies show us that up to 75% of people said if they were generally, genuinely asked by a friend to visit a church with them, that they would go. It's that simple. Now, I'm not saying if they come, then automatically they're a Christian, but I promise you this as your pastor, when they come to this church, they will sing about Jesus, they will see Jesus exalted, they will hear prayers that, that exalt Jesus, and the word of God will be proclaimed, and the gospel will always be shared, and a challenge will be given to trust in Jesus. And, and they may not respond that day, but you as their friend that's brought him, then you have the perfect opportunity to go to lunch and say, what did you, what did you think about the message? Have you ever trusted in Jesus? I promise you're going to get gospel content here, but then you can begin to talk and build conversations with individuals. And the stronger we get, the stronger that we gather, the more that the Lord increases, not just because we're butts in seats, but because God has assembled in this room gifts and talents and callings and, 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 and opportunities that every one of you represent if we're willing to serve. That leads us to our last point here. All believers should be giving. I just want to say this as a, I want to say this for two reasons. Number one, it's part, of our, it's part of our four words of our vision statement, and I had the rest of the G's here, so I needed to work in giving. But truly, when you look at this text, you see the church, everyone giving to the Lord, everyone giving of their time, their talent, their resources, everyone waking up and, and wondering, how can I serve the Lord today? We do not see mothballed Christians. We do not see the 80-20 rule when we look in the book of Acts. What we see is people who love Jesus, and because they love Jesus and they know what Jesus has done, they seek to serve them in their way. You're not all Pauls. You're, you're not all Barnabases. We're not all the apostles that we read here. But again, God has saved us for a purpose. We, we've been memorizing from Ephesians chapter 2 for our fighter verses. And, and I love it. it say, it'll say, you have been called unto good works which God has prepared beforehand. God called you to salvation. God worked and forgave your sin and called you unto salvation and gifted you with the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he has something for you to do. Are you doing it? Are you seeking to serve? What does it mean in your life today? 
Where are those inclinations that you have? Where are the opportunities that you find? Where are the things that, that, that you see that need to be done? That might very well be what God's called you to do, unless you're just a complainer. <laughs> but have you prayed about that? Have you looked at that? We want to see everyone growing in the Lord, going in the Lord, uh, groaning, guiding, giving, gathering. All of us are called to do this. Do you see that? This isn't just for Paul. We don't see the 80-20 rule. We see everyone engaged. Don't be stingy with what the Lord has given you. Everybody in this body is a somebody. And Jesus has called all of us together that we might serve together. And the only way that we can reach this community, the only way that we can do the things that, that Christ would have us to do, to make the impact that, that he would want us to have, is when we all begin to get together, when we all begin to serve, when we all begin to, to walk together. The Lord has placed an incredible time in this church of unity and love. Amen? He, he has. Now, my job as a pastor is to resist the urge of us trying to turn into a country club because we all like each other. I mean, it just is. That's naturally what we're going to want to do. Everything's good. Everything's, we, we like each other. Things are going well. Let's, let's just keep fellowshipping with each other. Let's not go do hard things. But we're called to do the hard things. We're called to be ambassadors of Christ. We're called to be disciples that make disciples. We're, we're called to go out and to proclaim Jesus is Lord to a lost and a dying world. And we do it together with many gifts, with many talents, with many opportunities. We seek to serve not only to minister to one another, but to be on mission with one another. As we close, let me remind you, we, we often talk about this, our next steps for many of you, there's a next step that, that you need to take. And maybe it's salvation. Maybe you've come to the point to where you know that, uh, that, that Christ has died for you. Maybe this Easter has been uh, very important to you and the Lord has revealed himself and you're ready to say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Maybe it's baptism. Maybe you recently have come to Christ and, and you've not been baptized yet. Maybe, maybe it's just something has happened that has kept you from being baptized, and you know that that's your next step in following the Lord and being in, obedient, in obedience to Him, as He commanded us to, to proclaim Him by, by being baptized as, as He was and, and being baptized to show that Christ has saved us. For many, it's membership. Now, listen, you can be a part of this church. There's things that you can serve and do in this church, and we love you, but... To be able to, to, to really join and to serve at a different level, you, you've got you've to be with us, right? I, I mean, that's just all there is to it. There is a, there is a barrier for where you can serve if, if you're just an active attender. Many of you, this church is your home, and you know it's your home. You're not going anywhere else. You love it here, but you just haven't put a ring on it. I want to encourage you to begin to pray about joining us in membership. Maybe you have questions, right? Um, if you have questions, I got good news for you. Number one, we, we love questions. We'd love to, to talk with you individually. Number two, if we're going to have a new members class here very soon. I think Brother Dave's going to talk about it here in a minute. And, and we would want you to be a part of that, that we can give you some more information, maybe fill in some gaps that you might need. Maybe you've been coming for a long time or not a long time, and you just know. Uh, let me tell you, you don't have to go to the class. You can just come up any Sunday at the end of the service and say, we're ready to join and be a part of the ministry here in the family at First Baptist of Meridianville. And, and you can do that any Sunday. But is that your next step? Maybe it's discipleship. Maybe you need to grow. You haven't gotten involved in a Sunday school class. There, there's, there, there is various Sunday school classes, D-Life groups, Bible studies. We have all kinds of opportunities for growth and discipleship around this church where you are interacting with one another. And most of these groups are open at any time that you, begin to, that you can join into. So don't think, oh, I just haven't been there. I don't know where they'll be. I can't. At any time, you can jump in, and we would want you to. 
Maybe it's ministry. You know that you need to serve. We have all kinds of opportunities here between our children and our preschool, our, our youth. We have all kinds of uh, of groups that serve in different ministries around the church. There's all kinds of ministries that we need to one another. Maybe there's a ministry that God's put on your heart and we don't do. We'd love to talk with you about it. Mission. Every one of us following Jesus needs a ministry and a mission. We need a place where we're serving each other, and we need a place where we are seeking to tell about Jesus. That's just not mission trips. It's all kinds of ways that that we serve and and things that we do that are outward focused to introduce people to the love of Jesus Christ. Are you engaged in those things? If you're not, I would challenge you to ask the Lord to give you the strength to take the next step, that you might grow in your faith, that you might not be one of those mothballed Navy ships just sitting out in the middle of the ocean that everybody goes, what is going on with that thing? but that Jesus would work in your life and that you would grow in him and experience him more and more. We're going to have a moment here where we'll sing a song of response. And and I want to invite you, maybe you have a prayer need, maybe uh, you want to just come and pray. Perhaps you are ready to join the church today. Perhaps there's another decision that you would like to make. Whatever it is, Brother David and I will be here. We'd love to receive you and to pray with you. But don't just hear God's word today and be challenged and walk away from it.